Mm-hmm. All right. Hello. Welcome back. We were kind of on a summer hiatus there for a minute. Uh, I'm Greg Claycar, and my buddy is Mark Skinner, and my buddy Ken Nelson. We are the three black probably not the only ones by now, but we are the three black frag grads. We get together uh, fairly frequently to uh, discuss uh, our passion, our love for, for photography. Uh, we, we all three have our uh, bachelor's from, um, bachelor's of fine arts from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, we get together and get some topics going. We uh, YouTube channel masterfully being uh, administered, by, administered by Mr. Nelson. Thanks, Ken. And uh, if you are interested, please, please, please subscribe, ring that bell so that you're reminded when we get a, uh, you know, when, it, when we post a new topic. Uh, Mark looking like Huey Lewis down there with, with the dark red sunglasses. <laughs> anyway, so we're, uh, uh, our topic today, it's my turn, and uh, I wanted to do something a little different and just say, uh, uh, Jack of all trades, you know. Photography is is has a wide, wide, wide range of possibilities and uh, uh, specialties that you can do. And uh, well, what I wanted to talk about is that um, you know uh, whether or not you choose to be uh, specific, because photography, you know, technically photo writing, you know, you're writing with light. So my, I was thinking, you know, well, should I be just a photojournalist, but then, you know, you can't say just one thing. Can you be just a portrait photographer or just a, a uh, street photographer without without knowing light? If you don't know light, you're not going to get, you know, <laughs> you're not going to get the results that you're expecting. So um, so I guess I'll start it off. You guys have anything to say, anything to pitch in, Jack of all trades? No, but go on. All right. Okay. I so, think if we move on to the photos, I think the photos will help inspire our conversation. Yeah. Good deal. All right. So I'll throw out my first picture uh, image of uh, Mr. Nelson. Thanks, Ken. Um, I've always liked portraiture. I, I worked uh, in my years post Pratt. I, I uh, worked in a portrait studio. There was, I was the uh, in-house uh, uh, photographer, and um, I really, really, really learned light then. Not that this is a good example of that, but I, I like this for um, for a number of reasons. That uh, portraiture can come in a lot of shapes, sizes, and forms, and uh, it 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 forces you to be very direct with the image. You know, um, why is a person looking into the camera? Why is the person not looking into the camera? Why is it so flatly lit? You know, why couldn't it have been contoured a bit more. What about the color? You know, things like that. That uh, portraiture, um, portraiture is demanding. It's not just as easy as just uh, setting up some lights, putting so putting a subject in there and then snapping a snapping an image or a frame or two. Um, portraiture is a much as much about the subject as it is the photographer, because the photographer has to be able to see an image, see the qualities in the person and capture their personality, make their personality come through. So um, can you be a jack of all trades or can you be, you know, just a you know, sharpshooter, just be uh, into one portion of photography? All right, go to the next one, Ken. Um, and uh, love food. I'm a, I'm a foodie, I admit it. And uh, I, I worked uh, for a time at uh, Condé Nast and um, they had an in-house uh, uh, gourmet magazine. They had an in-house shooter, and they'd uh, bring out these well-prepared meals and uh, photograph them and then share them around the studio, which was cool. But um, I thought, oh, same thing, you know, like portraiture photographer, just a different uh, subject matter. You put it in there, you light it well. This is I'm not saying this is lit well at all, by no means. I was more interested in eating the shrimp and making it look as good as it could. Anyway, um, is it like a shrimp fajita? Because it looks, it's nicely plated, but it looks like a fajita. Yeah, I don't remember. It was it was it was tasty, hot, hot and spicy shrimp with some of avocado and other goodies on there, and uh, it, it didn't last, didn't stand a chance. But yeah, I understand what you're saying. 
But, um, you know, if, if, like you just said, it hit you like a fajita. You know, if, if you photograph it a certain way, you'll capture a certain personality of, of the food that you're shooting. Well, you know what it is? The, the plate is black, and then the, the substrate seems to be sort of granite, or at least a granite look to it. Uh -huh. So the black plate, it could either be ceramic or some sort of metal. And usually when I see something that I, to me that reads as a, a metal plate with, with what looks to be a sizzling shrimp dish, uh, the, uh, the granite behind it looks like, well, you, you had to put the sizzling plate on something like a piece of stone in order to, to keep from burning up the, the kitchen. Uh, the, the, the slices of avocado, you know, they give away that it's not exactly a fajita, but in terms of your plating, it could be sort of, you know, you, you, you know, seared the shrimp somewhere else and then threw it on top of the mixed vegetables right after you put fresh avocado. Uh -huh. Well, yeah, yes and no, yes, but most definitely, yeah. That's where it's thrown. They were lovingly placed. Anyway, but yeah, yeah, well, I understand what you're saying. And, um, and those are decisions. You know, uh, what uh, Meisen scene, you know, what, what we, they teach us in, uh, in film school, you know, you're, you have to decide what's in the image. Could I have used a white plate? Yeah, I, I like plating stuff on white because it, it's a different, you know, it's a different aesthetic, a different look, a different feel. As Whereas, uh, like you were saying, the uh, fajita, you know, gives you that Southwest thing and stoneware and ceramics and yeah, for sure. You got anything, Ken, or are you good? I'm good. Go ahead. All right. All right. Moving right along. All right. Um, and again, uh, you know, a jack of all trades. You know, you're, you're for, well, more so for Ken as, as, as an accomplished uh, award-winning um, uh, street shooter. You know, you never know what you're going to come across. And uh, uh, I remember working with a, um, a photographer uh, from uh, San Diego Union Tribune uh, that and I was just watching him work. And when he showed up for this uh, portrait, and uh, I was like, okay, let's see what he's going to do. Now, he, he started by closing off the curtains, but then he did an unusual thing. He just brought one, he opened one curtain so that it, it gave his subject a, you know, highlight from like three quarter back and then he set up two strobes one on a slave one that bounced and it was just i won't say it was magical but i really 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 enjoyed the way he used light to light the subject and bring out you know a, a journalistic look as well as a an interesting looking portrait and um i, I felt that you know, you can't really get that type of um, capture, for, for lack of a better word or phrase, without knowing light, without knowing how to use, you know, your, your equipment, you know. Um, a camera would do so much, it'll give you so much, you could say, okay, I need this depth, I need, I need this amount of light. And I think you really, really, really need, he, for the photojournalist, to be a, a bit of a jack of all trades, to be able to use light in, you know, spur a moment, you've got like, what, 15 minutes to an hour to, to get your shot and get it back to your editor. And I thought he did a great job at it. Uh, similar to this, you know, I was like, oh my goodness, this, what, what, what is this? I just, I knew it was something that I wanted and I wanted it really badly, but I, I wasn't sure how to capture it. So I decided to shoot it with the stark background and you know have these balls floating in air and i really really feel that it, it it i could not have got this gotten this shot if i was just um thinking in one linear photographic way so okay that's all i got i'm gonna move right along and then i'll, I'll wrap it up with uh with the what the full term of that uh you could drop that pick i'm gonna go on to the next one ken but uh that that, that phrase um are you forget are you guys familiar with the full phrase jack of all trades mm -hmm. okay uh, master uh, of none okay 
Go ahead. Go oh, ahead. Well, I, what have you got? I, what have you got, Ken? Jack of all trades. Master of none. Okay, no, there's more ahead. to it than that. I know. Yes, I'm just, that's the only part I know. I'm sorry. So forgive me. No, no, it's okay. Go ahead, Mr. Skinner. Well, you want to you want to save it I to the know, end, or, or you want to save your pick? There's something you said that you, something you said that uh, you can be a jack, jack of all trades rather than a master of, of none. But a jack of all trades uh, is more useful than someone who's a specialist if if the specialization is something that you don't need. Okay. Yeah, because the full phrase is um, jack of all trades, but a master of none. But it's always better than a master of one. Yeah, there you go. And I, I, I thought when I heard that, I was like, wait a minute, I haven't heard the whole new thing. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, in, in one way, yeah, it's good to be a specialist. But in, in some, some instances, you know, I, I, and I feel, for me, for photography, it's good to know as many ways of capturing an image as possible. That's, just, that's where you get, a, a, I think, a wider variety of um, images or imagery, although... Like like Mark will tell me, and I appreciate that insight. You know, when you're when you're showing your work, you better be damn good at that one thing you're trying to get a client to buy into. So you know, there there's time for everything. But all right, let's move along. <laughs> Who's up next? Mark, you're up. No, it's Kenneth. Oh, no, Go ahead, Kenneth. and and I am, and as you described. Um, the topic, I realized I was totally <laughs> off the mark with this oh, topic. Oh, so I got you. <laughs> I went somewhere else totally different. That's I don't okay. know where my head was at when That's we when right. you did that. And I, I just see what you came up with. I just came up with something really just uh, mm -hmm. matter of fact, I'm not even sure if I want to share it, but um, I will go ahead and do this. Well, and it's weird. I don't know. It's because. It's been a while since we came, when, since we talked this topic, and it's kind of weird. So I'm just going to go with jack of all trades, master of none. Okay, so I started off with this because I was just going with a process and not necessarily with a master of none, right? So consider this to be a master of one because I guess that's where I'm going with this. So here's a here's an image um, that I I think you guys know from me. And it's actually happens to be one of my favorites, right? And so, and I talked about this with you recently where there was an update to uh, Lightroom and I was really trying to quote unquote master it, <laughs> okay? So, okay. so um, and I'm not one to do masking or any major modifications to my image, but when they introduced this process or this step, which is it's been available in Photoshop for years, but I've just never mastered it. But once they incorporated it into Lightroom, it became a, a sort of aha moment for me. And the abilities that they attributed, they, the abilities that they brought forth made it so much better for me visually to use this piece of, of, of the app. And now it's wholly integrated into my workflow. Uh, just being new with an update from over a month ago. So this is the image. And that actually what's happening is that I'm working this image and and I've actually showed it to you in the wrong in the wrong in the wrong order. Uh, because this is actually me working the image. So what I'll do is I'll just go through this it. The right? final? Was that the final? This is really not the final. So what happens is this is what this is basically the final. Okay. Right? And this is the final as it appears in Lightroom. All right, so this is the module. You're in the, uh, I think we're in the development module. Okay. And so what happens is that this is what happens when you actually have it auto-select, auto-masking, uh -huh. right? This is auto-masking. So up here in this corner is called the auto-mask where you just av actually have it mask and then have it automatically detect the mask. Okay. or the main subjects in your image. And it basically did an excellent job considering that there's so much to do, right? Oh, yeah. And so, and then I had to clean it up a little bit, but for the most part, it really worked very well. And, and I was like, wow, this is really good. And so with the ability to auto mask and have it auto select your subject, it really makes burning and dodging, the quote burning and dodging of your image much more easy. 
Evidently, so, it's very sensitive, Mr. Kata. Yeah. And so having the ability to burn and dodge digitally just makes life so much better because it makes the ability to speak to your image and master it even more so than you thought you could. So if you thought you were just playing around with contrast tonalities and stuff, right? When you add this ability to mask, which everyone who's retouching has known for decades, but once you incorporate it into Lightroom, it just becomes so much different. So what happens is, this is the original image that I was working with before the masking capabilities. And I thought, yeah, this image is really doing really well. I okay. liked it, right? But then I was like, once you incorporate this masking ability into it, you it, it changes your mindset about what the image can look like. And actually, this is my my image now. This is what I prefer to see now. This right. is how it's I much, prefer to work. Much more focused in this picture. Yes. However, it's a little deceptive because it actually looks like this is the actual exposure. And one of the things that I like a lot about the older uh, darkroom techniques or things or tools like Nick tools is that it looks a lot more organic because it's sort of a, a gradated, uh, more organic sort of burn and dodge effect. And th this is great in that it, it, eliminates the uh, evidence of manipulation. Um, and so in that way, it's a wonderful photo. I think the, the finish that you showed in the beginning is certainly the big, the best of the two, mm -hmm. which this is it. And then, but uh, you know, the mask is great, uh, but, but I tend to, for that kind of thing, like the, uh, I, I tend to like the, the, the Nick tools. Um, that's just me, but okay. I can, I, but this is, it's, it looks great. It, it just looks, looks like yeah, the subjects kind of, really pop forward. Yeah. Um, not sure if you lightened them or, you know, did a reverse mask and, and darken the background. That's but. basically what happens. What happens, and that's basically what you're doing. And what I'm doing is I'm taking the whole, I'm taking the original image and right. I'm actually darking it down. The whole image globally goes down, right? Huh. I just darken the image for the background because I know okay. what's going to happen since my main subjects are masked. I know that it doesn't matter because I can I can modify those and individually itemize them individually. So what I do is I darken down the whole image, right? And it may not show here because in this particular instance, I, I I'm, you're seeing a finished image, but don't worry about that. What happens is, you know, I darken down the image globally. I supply I apply the mask. Then this is what the image looked like before, and that's what it looks like after. And what happens is, yes, there's a popping that happens that makes the image speaks more. It brings your subjects more into focus. Yeah, it's do like that again. Best, do uh, that again. When you used to put ruby lith and amber lith in the uh, in the in the photo stat machine. Yeah, do what so, again, Greg? Uh, did you say yeah? Flip between the final and the again. Okay. That's the original. That was the that was my original final. That's the raw. Yeah. That's the original okay. final, not the raw. It's the original final. Okay, okay. The row is flat, so I, this is already this is already modified. This the contrast little, adjustments are yeah, are there. A little distracting. Yeah, when you pop the other, when you darken the other, the background it, it really pops those two. It is the skin tones are, are popping everything. Okay, that's well, that's the appeal. Like that also, did you knew the gentleman's face? Uh huh. Well, right, they, because even yeah, within yeah. The, within the mask, you can you can modify the tonalities, you can modify the contrast. You have the ability to do everything you do, except that it's only a, 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 a applicable to the mask um, part. And so, right. so if you brought that up a quarter stop and pushed the background about three quarters stop, then it's like yeah. a stop. it's like you've put it, applied a stop. Uh, excuse me, it's like you've applied a, a a spotlight only to them, but that spotlight replicates the ambient light. Yeah, you can so, you can uh, you can flip it and then like not not just darken the background. You can blur it and other things. Yes. Yes, you can. But okay. that would be more of a manipulation than I'm willing to go with. I just want to I just want to do tonality and contrast control and make sure that the the subjects pop now. Right, regular um, darkroom stuff so that you can focus your your so you can drive your viewer a little more. Yeah, drive the viewer more to yeah that mm -hmm. that. That's it. You, you know, I would, I would, I would throw if I had that was using that kind of control. I would definitely do like a radial blur and make everything else look like it's moving and spinning. And they uh, were, would, but that, that's yeah. I understand what you're saying, but I, I would play with it. I would push it. 
But um, which which uh which um, Lightroom are you using? It's a uh, Lightroom Classic. It's Classic. the uh, okay. subscription version. Okay, cool, good stuff. So you feel that you're you're mastering something new, or you think that you're just a jack of all trades and you're going to take a piece of everything? No, no, because I don't think you can consider me a jack of all trades. I mean, uh, the history that I have sort of makes it in a way. Um, camera sales, uh, studio, um, still life studio, you know, that history, that background and street photography. Um, there's still so much out there in terms of photographic possibilities, uh, you know, genres of phot photography. Jack of all trades. Um, I can't, I don't want to be considered that, but I just want to. <laughs> You know, master of one would be fine. Oh. Which one would you master? The one I'm doing now. <laughs> the street, street shooting? Street, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't think there's an end to it, to be honest with you. I just don't no, think there's an end. No. no, definitely not. Yeah, keep shooting for sure. I, I really, that's one of my favorite images also. Boy, if I had a couple of grand, I'd, I'd buy you like a like a eight millimeter, like almost fisheye, but something super, super duper wide. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave that alone. All right. You got anything else? Any anything else? That's good. That's me. All right, moving right along. Mark, what you got? Let's wrap it up. All right. Yeah, jack you said of all jack, trades. You said jack of all trades, and I'm always talking about wedding photography, and I really don't show any wedding photography. So <clears throat> a few years ago, I did weddings, and I did weddings for myself. I did weddings for a company, and I just want to show a few of these. And and what wedding photographs are pretty much the only ones in which I. I really started to do anything that was sort of photo manipulation. This is a photograph that was done in a garden, a very famous garden, and there uh, I did use a, uh, a, a strobe to fill in the, the couple. We had to, I had to pose them and had to balance the light between the background and the foreground, but there's sort of a sort of a vintage look to it, and that was something that was done in, uh, what do they call it, the Nick Tools. Uh, so I just wanted to show you guys that I am I'm not totally opposed to uh, advanced retouching when it's applied uh, in a practical and um, appropriate way. I mean, for the romantic uh, notion of, of marriage, uh, I did that here. If you go to the next one, I did that here. Now, what's interesting about this, that previous photo was a rainy day. So the fact that I had a, a lamp with me was really important. It was a strobe, uh, and, and it was really important because I could fill in. Uh, in this case, those clouds that you see, it was dark. It was rainy, and this is in Liberty State Park where a lot of couples go to have wedding photos done. Uh, and in this particular day, it just it downpoured. I mean, it rained so much, I had a reflector card that I, one of those big uh, reflectors that unfurl. Yeah. Uh, and I I had to put that over the couple for a split second in order to keep the rain from raining on them really hard. I had to have the guests hold that for me because it was raining so hard that day. And uh, you can see by the severe crop that in that case, once again, I, I wanted to make sure that I, uh, you know, just focused on the couple. And uh, the fill light is a strobe. It's a one of those speed lights that go on top of the, the camera. But in this case, I had it uh, off camera with a with a cord attachment. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to the, the third one, uh, I have a lot more control in the third one. This is just sort of an insert inset piece for a wedding uh, that I photographed. I did the whole wedding for them. And uh, sometimes when you put together wedding albums, you want to have uh, bits and pieces of the things that people paid for. Uh, and so uh, they put up a lot of lights and this is in the catering hall in, in order to get uh, really nice portraits of them and still interesting still photos of the, uh, the cake and the decorations and so forth. And this is just one of the photos. This is the full frame of the, of the, of the image. Um, not really much retouching or anything like that here. It's just sort of contrast. Um, but. I, I did this because usually you see me photo show uh, sort of a product photo or um, uh, some sort of street photo or um, maybe a, an old uh, pageant photo, a fashion photo or something. And the idea that being a jack of all trades, I mean, I've done, done a lot of work. And I know, Ken, you were talking about being in studio. It's funny because 
You and I worked in the studio together. Greg, you talked about working in another studio. I worked as a darkroom technician in that same studio also before that. Uh, I mean, I've worked for, uh, you know, a, a bridal gown company as a photographer for them. Did a lot of sports photography. Um, I think the idea is that when you are a jack of all trades, you you may have a an area of concentration that you prefer to work in. But for me, it's really important to be able to be facile. You know, when you're photographing weddings, you do not have a tremendous amount of time when you're uh, outdoors. Uh, even those two photos you saw earlier, you know, you, you only have a few minutes. The, the bride and groom, no matter how much time they tell you you're going to have, you always have less time than they agree to even contractually. So you have to be prepared to, to and, and in this situation like this where it was just raining, you know, as soon as you put the camera up to your eye and it just pours down, you have to take the photo. If you don't take the photo at the location that they paid the chauffeur to drive them to, you have lost the shot. So you you have to you have to bring back photographs for them, and that's just the the bottom line. Obviously, with the garden photo, I had a little bit more time, but really not a lot. Uh, you'd be amazed. I, uh, you know, I had to beg them to stand over there really, you know, quickly. You know, and, and it's not their fault. They're just very excited. They just got married. All their family and friends are around. Everybody wants to go eat. You know, people are relieved that everyone got there on time. Uh, so uh, I just wanted to kind of show this type of work because it's work I've done. And, and I haven't really shown this in the 90 some odd photos, uh, uh, episodes that we've done. And I've always talked about it. So that's really it. I mean, being a jack of all trades, it isn't the most desirable position to be in uh, when you're starting. You don't feel like you want to just be a generalist. There are a few people who were really good at that, like Gregory Heisler, excellent generalist, um, and, and a few others. But these days, people tend to see uh, commercial photography and wedding photography as distinctly different areas of expertise. And, and, and that's really sad because a lot of the skill sets that are required to do great commercial work um, are applicable to the standard of, of wedding photography that people expect today. That's really it. Interesting perspective. It, it's it's something uh, I'm not sure if we really. Well, I'll speak for myself. I'm not something. I, it's not something that I really uh, gave much thought to when I was uh, there at Pratt. But um, it was like, uh, once you got out, it's like, oh, my, OK, now what do I do? You know, <laughs> you get whatever work you can. You know, you shoot a little bit of this, you shoot a little bit of that. But um, all the while, whatever it is, you, you, you begin to develop your focus and you develop your, your eye for that. You know, it, right. And I, I think it's based on the opportunities afforded you. You know, if you're afforded certain opportunities, you have the opportunity to concentrate. I mean, I, I know people who, if uh, without going into specifics, if, if you ask them what type of uh, artist they are, like just painting, you know, they, they started out trying to be a particular type of painter and they were afforded opportunities to do other type of work. And so their entire career is based in this other genre and they're very happy doing that. But that wasn't necessarily their initial, uh, you know, decision. You know, they may have wanted to be a, a comic strip artist, but they wound up being a gallery painter or something like. Oh, yeah, that, I understand that. You know, that. That's in, in a way they they have they have a basis, they have a root, and wherever they go, you know, I I, I can't, you know, you, we always hear. Well, I'll speak for myself. I I hear from time to time, you know, um, well, I started off doing this. I'm doing this now. But I always, I can always draw on what I started. With, you know, the foundation is is important. You know, and I, I I I will go back to it. I don't care how many years it's been. There's been always something when I'm shooting that that takes me back to Pratt and lighting and everything. And um, you know, when I started doing film, the biggest thing, you know, I, I met a bunch of folks that. Fabulous cameras, you know, all the tech you can, you could, you know, that all the, the, the highest credit card limit could buy for you. Red cameras, all of that. 
most of them did not know how to like and that was that that separates you know the the regular guy from from the big boys and the big young women the big women because ah you well, I've got, uh, you mentioned film. I've got some Pratt trivia for you. You know, uh -oh. uh, get, do you know what famous actor went to Pratt first before they became an actor? Mm -hmm. Went to Pratt before they became an actor. Greg Claghorn. No. Uh, I don't know. In yeah, addition to you, I think you were an actor before you went to Pratt, but before they be, went to Pratt first and then they were an actor. I don't know. Can't Very famous. Answer? Wait, let me look it up on Google real quick. I'll give you a. I'll give you a clue. Uh, in the 1970s, they were probably box office number one, quite a bit. They're probably. I can't say. 70s? For sure. Yeah, it's not Elliot Gould. I know he was box office number one for a while, but it's not him. Somebody very, very famous in the 1970s and 80s. 90s. He does movies more sparingly now, but he's still still active. If I if I give you this last clue, you'll know exactly who it is. Huge contributor to the film community west of the Mississippi, but not quite Hollywood. Oh, that gives it away. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Not I'm a clue. Sorry. All right. One more. One more clue. Oh boy. Park City, Utah. What? Yeah, Park Redford. City, you took about Redford. Yep, Robert Redford went to Pratt before he was an actor. Okay, that is well, really maybe a, in conjunction with, but before he became a famous actor. That is a very hit, well hidden uh, factoid. I yep. never what heard was that. He majoring in? I think it was painting. Oh, I think it was painting, but he but he he did attend Pratt before he became a famous before he became a famous actor. Was he a graduate? Uh no. Mm -hmm. He attended. <laughs> now. Do you, uh, do you know uh, who got a what famous actor, also in that same age range, who this one's African American, who received the Guggenheim Fellowship before they became a famous actor? Okay. And they, are we going to use that in our trivia episode? Yeah. This is uh, it, Jack of Well, all he didn't go to Pratt. This, this guy didn't go to Pratt, but he's a. Well, you mentioned film, so. Yeah, I mentioned a bunch of stuff, but we're not tangents. Go no, ahead. I've got my Hollywood book on. You mentioned film. I've got my Hollywood uh, look on today, so yeah. Okay. Well, what's the answer? Yeah. What's the answer? Just give us the answer, please. My retro Hollywood book. Um, the answer is Billy D. Williams received a Guggenheim Fellowship for in painting before he became an actor, and he actually wanted to be a painter, but this acting thing was good enough to pay for his 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 paints. Yeah. Okay. That that sounds logical because I know that. Yeah, I I know that his history as a painter is 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 there. I know his history as a. I didn't know that. I didn't make the connection. So, but basically, the reason why I mention these two at this point is because you know it's not as disparate as these two stories where you know they're painters and they become actors. But a lot of times, if you're a jack of all trades, if you're very skilled in in a variety of things, you can be successful in one or the other. And so the concentration gets more focused in one area where the opportunities are. I think, I, well, keeping on that track, I think there's even a, a more of a, of a for me, I, I have a disconnect with um, the term multidisciplinary artist, uh, because to me that if implies to a degree jack of all trades as well. Uh, you know, the question is, what is multidisciplinary? Is that more than multidisciplinary can just mean more than one. So therefore, it could be two or any combination of two and up, you know, but I but I have always been a little bit uh, confused at that. And 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 what expertise comes of that within each specific discipline that you're, you know, uh, ascribing to? Um, well, you know, these days, multidiscipline, it could can can be very uh, synthesized, you know, you know, file new, manipulate close, <laughs> cut paste, you know, whether you're uh, someone who does graphic design or photography or video, a lot of the tool or web design, a lot of the tools are uh, so similar that multidisciplinary uh, doesn't require 
uh, the same breadth of skills as you did when we when we went to Pratt. I mean, if you were a graphic designer when we went to Pratt, you had to understand how to use a ruling pen, and you had to understand the difference between uh, you know hot press and cold press illustration board. Okay, we're really getting if way were, off topic. Okay, yeah. But, but, yeah, 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 yeah,
No, what are you working on? Photoshop and Photoshop. Lightroom. Lightroom, forgive me. But check out Illustrator. Illustrator has some fun things, too. <laughs> Just keep shooting, keep exploring, and uh, subscribe. Come talk to us. Leave us some questions. Maybe there's a topic we can uh, we can chat with. And uh, eventually, when we go live, we'd love to have uh, good feedback. Um, that's it. I'm Greg Clayton. We are the Three Black Pratt Grads. This is Mark Skinner and Kenny Nelson. And we're going to wrap it up. Have a great summer.